You're listening to The Power Project. I'm your host, Brandy Both, and it's my goal each week to inspire and empower you to lead purpose-filled lives and own your God-given power. Now, sometimes this comes in the form of spotlighting women that are doing just that, and other times it comes from me just talking to you like a girlfriend should. And speaking of the way girlfriends talk, I think there is no person more equipped to highlight that is owning her power and leading a purpose-filled life other than Ms. Rachel Hollis. No, she's not on the show today, so you can go ahead and get your breath back in your throat. However, I'm sure, I'm certain that she will be one day. But we're going to go ahead and do a book study over Girl Stop Apologizing and kick it off this week. So let's jump in, shall we? Okay, you guys, so I have a Facebook group over uh, on Facebook where I have a community where we discuss different books and different things that are going on in our lives, and then I have a page, the Power Project page on Facebook. If you haven't found it, go check it out. So I'm doing an eight-week book study over there, so I thought, I really think that the topics that are in the first three chapters of this book are so relevant to nonprofits, business, ministry, leadership. So I wanted to take a spin off of that book study and bring it over here to the podcast for this week. So I'm just going to go ahead and let you guys listen to that Facebook Live that I did. But first, this week's review goes to Rachel Stump. She said, hey, I listened to your podcast last night. It was episode 11, the one about grit. And I just wanted to say that it was exactly what I needed to hear. Even though I'm in high school and not running a nonprofit or a business, what you said about what it takes to accomplish goals and not being afraid to fail just spoke to me. And I just wanted to say thank you because your podcast is awesome. Thanks, Rachel. We think you're awesome too. Now let's go ahead and dive right in. Welcome to the Girl Stop Apologizing book study. My name is Brandy Voth, and I'm the founder of The Power Project. So last spring, I started The Power Project community with the idea of inspiring people with stories of women that were just really leading purpose-filled lives. And I started that on March 8th. Shortly after that, I was told about the book, uh, Girl, Wash Your Face. And I had a few people that thought it would be relevant to me, my business, and what it is that I do. And it fit really great. So we did a book study on it over on the Facebook page. So if uh, you're watching on Instagram and you want to join that community, you can check out my bio for where to find our community over there where we're going to discuss this book. Um, The new book that we're discussing now is Girl, Stop Apologizing. And it is Rachel Hollis's book geared towards business and side hustle. And so I thought that Girl, Wash Your Face was really applicable to my personal business. But I think that Girl Stop Apologizing truly is. So I wanted to do a book study over that. This week, we are doing chapters one through three. And they happen to be chapters that I have personally trained on uh, these ideas and spoken on these in business before. So. Throughout this entire uh, study, I want you to know that this is not going to be a regurgitation of that book. I'm not down for that type of a book study. I'm going to take those topics of those chapters. I'm going to tell how I apply them to my life and my business and how you can apply them to your life and your business. So you're not signing up for... um, the Rachel show. You can catch that, I think, on Tuesday mornings on Facebook and IGTV if you're looking for that. I'm going to give you uh, the gospel according to Brandy with these topics. So without further ado, you guys, I think that we'll go ahead and jump into the book. If you don't have the book, don't worry. You can always um, go get it, listen to it on Audible. I like to put it on on Audible when I'm driving down the road, and it helps, uh, helps me to be able to best utilize my time and make the best of the hour commute that I have driving to and from meetings. So uh, you can get it later. You can come back to this and check it out after you read chapters one through three. So the chapters this week are going to be uh, 
about the first one is called uh, Other Women Don't Do That. Let me make sure that I've got the right title for it. So that's not what other women do is chapter one. And then chapter two is I'm not a goal oriented person. And chapter three is I don't have enough time. So I don't know about you guys. I run a business where I hear these things all the time, like all the time on a daily basis that, and I just am, that's, that's the whole reason I created the power project is because I wanted people to see that we can move past those excuses and we can be the type of woman that we want to be. And we can set goals and we can have all the time that we want to create and carve out for whatever it is that is our purpose and our passion, our why, and what we are striving for. So on the, the, uh, that's not what other women do. I want to speak to that for a bit because I have been my entire life doing things that other women don't do. And I like Rachel and Hollis and I both had the same religious background upbringing, um, which is just ironic to me, super crazy. And so there were a lot of things that I was raised being told that women don't do, which is like, I'm kind of a rebel and uh, I kind of don't deal well with being told that I can't do something. It's like, tell me that I can't and I'm going to do it. So I grew up really um, doing things and being pulled to and wanting to do things that other women don't necessarily do. So I was raised really in a in a community where women were expected to want to get married and have kids and be an amazing cook and take care of the house. And that was not my goal when I was younger. That was like far from my goal. And I'll never forget, I planned on becoming an attorney. I wanted to be like an international corporate lawyer. And that's what I was pushing for. That's what I was running for. And I remember there were two different conversations that will always stick out in my mind from my grandparents who are two of my favorite people on the face of the planet, but they really didn't know what they were in for when they had four boys and I was the first grandkid and I was a girl and I did not fit the mold of anything that they had ever anticipated for a girl to fit. So my, I remember my grandpa telling me about my high school boyfriend telling me that he was never going to be a rich man. He was never going to take care of me. And I, I couldn't even wrap my brain around what it was that he was telling me because I thought, why does that even matter? I'm going to make my own money and carve out my own way. And who cares what kind of money he makes? But that was my grandpa taking care of my grandma all my life. And she had, you know, not worked for 35 years. And he had always made sure that she was provided with whatever she needed to be provided for. So he just expected me to want that lifestyle. And that wasn't what my little like 18 year old heart had. And then I remember my grandma saying, um, she asked me if I planned on getting married and having a family, why was I going to college and why was I wanting to get a law degree and why was I doing everything that I was doing? And she really had her, um, like spirit crushed when I told her that I wasn't sure that I planned on getting married and having kids, but I definitely planned on this career. Now, fast forward, God had greater plans for me. God had a different path and a different journey for me in life that looked like me becoming a stay-at-home mom for 10 years, which I am so grateful for. So grateful. I was so thankful to be able to be home with my kids when they were little. I was that little stay-at-home housewife that cooked um, the homemade organic food from scratch and had a blast with my babies at home. And I had so many people that were envious of my lifestyle, of me getting to be able to stay home with the kids and play with the kids and really relish their younger years. But I'll be completely honest. I still knew that there was something bigger for me. There was something else I was supposed to be doing outside of my kids and my home. And so then when I did uh, jump into my business, it didn't look like the business that other women go back to work and do after their kids go back to school. It looked like something different. So I just want to encourage you today. And listen, you guys, some of you watching are uh, from the same hometown that I'm from. Some of you are not. Those of you that are watching from my hometown will know that for me to say I'm a podcast host 
where I live, most people don't know what podcasts are. And if they do, they're not listening to them. So I have literally spent my entire life doing things that other women don't do. And I'm okay with that. So I want to encourage you today, if there's something that is a a fire in your heart, if there's something that you want to do that you're seeing the other people around you not do, and you're afraid of not being the women that they are and doing the things that they do, I just highly encourage you to get out there and do what it is that you want to do. Get out there and do what sets your soul on fire, what puts a step in a spring in your step. Go do that and go do that big and hard and know that like I'm your biggest cheerleader right here telling you to go for it and do it. So that's chapter one of the book. And then, um, and you can read to see all of, of Rachel's takeaway on that. Chapter two is I'm not a goal oriented person. So, okay, here we go. I hear things like this quite a bit and it just, it like, it makes me a little bit bananas because you don't have to be a goal oriented person to be a goal oriented person. You can absolutely become a goal oriented person. So I love when you, when we talk about things that um, we may have been good at in life or we had to learn, there are things that are skills. Like no one just wakes up and they're like, I'm super organized. I'm super scheduled. I'm super structured. I'm a great speaker. I'm a great leader. I'm a great goal setter. These are are skills that can be taught and learned. And the more that you try them, the more that you work on them, the better you're going to become. So maybe you're thinking right now, okay, I want to start a nonprofit organization, or I want to start a business, or I want to step into this role of leadership. And I know that people tell me I'm supposed to have goals, but I don't know I don't know how to set goals. I don't know how to achieve goals. I don't know how to reach goals. So Rachel has her way in the book. I personally have a little course that I offer that I give people um, on uh, Instagram. Sorry, I'm just adjusting my screen just a smidge. I have a course that I offer and I have some trainings that I do one-on-one with people where I dig into helping them learn how to set the goals. So I always say that I'm a dreamer. Like I'm a dreamer. My husband's a dreamer. That's one of our favorite things to do together, but we're really, we're goal setters because we don't just throw the dream out into the universe. Like this is not that book that said you put things on a vision board and you just let, and they just come to fruition. You have to actually create action to make your goals be realized. So I have five steps that are tangible steps to be able to help you set goals, reach goals, crush goals. And so the first one, because like I said, even if you're at home right now and you don't think you're a goal oriented person, you can become one. You can literally become anything you set your mind to aside from, I don't know, a flying two headed giraffe or something. My brother always has some smart response for me when I'm like, you can do anything you put your mind to. And he's like, I can't fly. I want to fly. So on the goals, the first thing that you're going to need to do for goal setting, and I've got my bullets over here because I tend to sometimes ramble, but if I keep it on bullet points, I keep it a little more focused. So the first is going to be list your goals. So whether you are a detail oriented person that wants to put them into an Excel spreadsheet shoot me now. That is not me. That is not my love language. It does not bring me joy in life. Or you're a person that is a free flowing person that likes to throw your goals down in a journal. So I am the person that throws my goals down in a journal. All right. And sometimes it looks nice and organized. And sometimes it just looks like free flowing thoughts. I want you to list every single goal that you want to accomplish in the next year. Every single one of them. I don't care if they're large, lofty stretch goals or if they're like small attainable victories. I want you to list every single thing. So if you're watching this in the playback, you can pause this and go write all of those things down. Or you can do that after we get off of this 
this uh, episode. Are you thinking right now that you've heard enough, you have what it takes, and you're ready to start a side hustle? Well, girl, I think now is as good of time as ever that you jump over to the-powerproject.com backslash powerful business. Read my story there about how I got started in this business, and then fill out that email form and I would be happy to schedule a call with you and discuss more in depth what it is that I do. That's the-powerproject.com slash powerful business. Write down all the goals that you want to attain in the next 12 months. And don't be afraid to put them down. If there is a fire in your heart that is pulling, that is telling you that you have this goal that you want to attain, write it down, list it out. Okay. So like God put that goal in your heart. It it didn't just come from nowhere. So then the second thing you're going to do in the goal setting, like how to become a goal oriented person. Second thing you're going to do is you're going to prioritize your goals. So basically if you're a high achiever, which um, most of you watching probably are, I am myself, then you probably have goals bouncing around inside of your head constantly. Like I, if you guys looked inside of my brain right now with all of the things that I want to accomplish in the next 12 months, or you looked at my list of what I want to accomplish in the next 12 months, you would be completely shocked and be like, how does she get anything done? So this is where we have to give our goals priority. We have to decide what is the most important to us right now? What is the number one thing we're trying to accomplish today? So those goals don't have to go away that you have for the next 12 months. We just have to decide what order they need to come in, right? Because if you don't give them the priority, you can't give them the attention and the focus that they need. So sometimes there's a chalkboard over my shoulder with um, a scripture doodled out. So I'll take that chalkboard and I'll just free flow, like what's going on for the month for me, my goals that I need to achieve for that month, whatever category they're in. And then I will put numbers by which one I want to get done first. Okay. So give your goals priority because when you give them priority, you can put them in the space where they get all of your attention. Otherwise you end up like I did yesterday where I just had one of those days that I ran in place all day long. I did not give my goals priority and I tried to accomplish four goals simultaneously. And I ended up not accomplishing any of them. So that's what I like to call running in place. That is not running for your goals. That is running in place. So the third, uh, the third step you're going to take to becoming a goal oriented person is to then sort your goals. Okay. So I want you to separate your stretch goals from your small goals. So we have them prioritized, right? So we have like 10 goals we want to achieve in the next 12 months. All right. And we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have them numbered in which order we want to achieve them first. But now we need to separate them into two columns and we need to say stretch goals, small attainable goals. And the reason for that is the small attainable goals give you victories along the way to your stretch goals. So you might have a a large goal of reaching a promotion in your company a level, um, leveling up in your business. So that might be your number one priority. So that's your number one priority, but it's a stretch goal that's going to take these other priorities over here that are smaller goals that will help you get to that big goal. So maybe that's our number one priority, but over here, I have a second priority and a fourth priority that are small goals that will help me get to that. So these are the goals I can do right now that will help me get to that promotion, that level in business that I want to be at in 12 months. So does that make sense to you guys? We're going to sort them between our stretch goals, our massive, our big, audacious, hairy goals, our God-sized goals. We've got those in one column and we've got our stretch goals in another column. And we've got them prioritized by what we're working for first. Okay? So... The fourth step to becoming a goal-oriented person is that you're going to set deadlines. Yep, you're going to set deadlines. And you're going to push for those deadlines. And I can't tell you how many deadlines I have fallen short of in the past. 
it's okay. Like it's okay if you fall short of that deadline, but you need a realistic deadline in place because literally a goal, remember I talked about dreams and goals, a goal without a deadline is a dream. You can want something all day long, but you're going to need to put a deadline on it. I want to achieve this much in sales volume by this date. This is my deadline. So then I'm going to break it down, right? So let's say you're writing a book, okay? If you want to write a book and you want to write a book in the next 12 months, you're giving yourself a 12-month deadline to write a book and you want to write about a 60,000 word book. So let's break that down into what that looks like. 12 months, 60,000 words, 5,000 words a month. I can totally do that. I can attain that. I mean, heck, I can write 10, 15,000 words a day if I need to, but you need to figure out what you realistically can do. Don't give yourself a crazy deadline that's going to set you up for failure. Like give yourself a realistic deadline that pushes you, that stretches you, but that also is able to be attained in the long run. So do what you know you can absolutely positively deliver, but put a timestamp on it so that you know when you're working to hit that. And guess what? If you fall short of stretching for that deadline, that's okay. Set a new deadline, but don't give up. Don't fall apart and don't stop just because you didn't make that deadline. So the fifth, the fifth step of becoming a goal oriented person and crushing your goals is the most crucial. This is where most people fall short of crushing their goals. So where most people fall short of pursuing their goals. You have got to take action. All right. Because a goal without action, you've got a goal. It's got a deadline. It's sorted. It's, it's sorted by priority. It's sorted by stretch versus small attainable goals. We have given this goal all the life that it possibly can be breathed into it. But now you have to take action. So if you don't take action, your goal without action is like a vehicle without fuel. It is never going to get to its final destination. So the action that you pour into that goal is the fuel that you're putting in your vehicle that is driving you to the finish line of your destination. So let's make this attainable again. Let's break it down into layman's terms because I am all for tangible takeaways and how this applies to your personal life. Let's say you want to lose 50 pounds in the next 12 months. And you'll notice I give things a 12 month timestamp because I come from a place of working on 12 month goals, one month goals, one week goals, one day goals. Like I work backwards. That is the easiest way for me to attain my goals. So if you're going to lose 50 pounds in 12 months, that's roughly around four pounds a month. So now we have a deadline, we have a goal, we have that we have it prioritized, we have it worked out. So now we have to do the work and put the work in to make sure what am I going to do today to lose four pounds this month? What am I going to do today that's going to result in me losing a pound this week, which is going to result in me losing four pounds in the month, all right? So we're going to come up with a diet plan. We're going to come up with an exercise plan. We're going to make conscious decisions daily that are going to affect us health-wise, right? We're going to I may have fallen off the wagon yesterday and I may have had a Dr. Pepper, but today I'm going to choose to have my water. I'm going to get my water intake. I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to stay away from the carbs, whatever your diet plan is. And I don't have one I endorse. It is whatever works for your body. That is your action. The same goes with business. The same goes with writing books. The same goes with launching a podcast or running a nonprofit Give action to your goals. Give feet to your prayers. Give action to your goals. And make sure that you take action. Otherwise, all of the steps of setting your goals to become a goal-oriented person have fallen to the wayside and are null and void. All right, that's chapter two. Chapter three, y'all, there is a soapbox and I can preach on this one. Chapter three says, I don't have the time. 
I don't have time. This is the number one thing that I hear. Like, I don't have time is the number one excuse, objection, pushback that I hear from people with starting a business, with starting a nonprofit, with volunteering, with losing weight, with exercising, with getting more sleep. I don't have time. And I am here to bring you the honest to goodness truth, you guys, because I come from a place of brutal honesty. You don't have a time problem. You have an ownership problem. You're not owning your hours of your days, of your weeks, of your months, of your year. People make time for what they place priority on. All right. I promise you that you make time to watch your kids play sports or do ballet or whatever your kids are into. You make time to do something for your spouse. You make time to show up for your friends. You make time to watch all of the Real Housewives and anything that Lisa Vanderpump ever puts out into the world. You have time. You make time to sit around and watch mindless drama on television. You have time for The Bachelor. You have time for cocktails with friends. You have time. You just have to take ownership of your time and you have to decide this is the time I'm going to allot to this area of my life right now. This is the time I'm willing to put into something. And I want you to change your verbiage the next time you find yourself saying, I don't have time. Instead, I want you to say, it's not worth it to me. My goal is not worth me turning the television off and putting work in. My goal is not worth me saying no to social hour and saying yes to work hour. I'm not worth me carving out an extra hour a day just for myself. I'm not worth me turning off the radio in the car and putting on a podcast that I can learn from, that I can grow my business with. That is what you're saying when you're saying, I don't have time. This new business that can give me time freedom from the dead end job I'm in is not worth me spending 15 hours a week growing it. Okay. It's a time management problem. You guys, it's an ownership problem. It is not a time problem. We all have the exact same 24 hours in a day. It's what we do with them. That is what makes the difference in the end. So there is a timestamp on your life. I hate to be the person to tell you that. We all have have a deadline, have a timestamp on our life. It's what we do with our lives in that time period to make an impact that makes the difference. It's how we spend our hours, our minutes, our seconds, our days, our weeks, our months, our years. So that sounds great. How do we bring a tangible takeaway to owning your 24 hours? For starters, okay, so Rachel has her five to strive listed in the book. I'm going to give you a few ways that I own my time. So she talks about um, creating the timeline of the week. That is really important on Sundays to do. Like I do that on Sundays. Sundays are my day that I look at it. I have things scheduled because I work on a monthly schedule. And so I have things scheduled throughout the week, but I have to look at it and decide What does this week look like? Did my kids' baseball games and practices change, which is never ending? Did we have an extra meeting thrown in there that I forgot about? Do I need to move this lunch schedule around? Look at your week on Sunday. Don't just let your week pop up. Don't let your reminders pop up in your iCal that you're missing an appointment that you forgot about. Plan for the week ahead by prepping on Sunday. Sunday afternoon is a great time for me to prep for the week and then um, discuss it like about what's going on with the people that you have schedules, follow up with the people that you have appointments on the books for on Sunday. Hey girl, we're supposed to meet up for coffee on Tuesday. Are you still on? That way you're not left with someone dropping that appointment at the last minute and you having an open hour that you could have utilized for writing your book or working your business or planning your nonprofit, whatever it is. So that's um, what the timeline looks like for me. It looks like following up with all of the appointments that I have on the books. And then the um, second, she talks about having the, the sacred hours, like the sacred time. So I personally, when I I have to do this and I have to say 
when I have my hours set aside for work hours, they have to be work hours. And when you work from home, that is so easy to get sidetracked from. It is so easy to say, I have to go do the laundry. Um, I need to go do the dishes. I need to go call a friend. I know when you are working, when you are in the zone and you're doing the work, you're putting the work in, you have to be 100% engaged in that work hour. So ways to do that. I turn my computer and my phone to do not disturb so that I don't get notifications from anyone about anything that might distract me. Because in a world of living on social media and working on social media, y'all know that the distractions are alive and well. So I turn it on do not disturb so that I make sure that I am showing up for myself in my work hour. And then also, you guys, make sure that you are not jumping onto social media and using that as work time. Okay. Scrolling through social media is not income producing activity. It is not work time. So maybe if you feel like you're running short on time, maybe you should start charting where your time is spent. What are you doing with your time? How much time are you spending having conversations on social media? How much time are you spending watching videos of cats on social media? make those work hours, actual work hours. So um, then she talks about your minimum hours being your best hours. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with, um, with like an owl versus lark mentality. So this is how you decide when your, your height, your peak of uh, success, achievement, when your best hours are. Are you an owl? Are you a lark? So an owl is a, is a late to bed person that is more productive in the evenings and night hours. A lark is the early up. I'm most productive at 5 a.m. type of person. I'm naturally an owl. And so I know that socially, I'm much more social in the evenings and I'm much more talkative and I'm more, um, more interactive on social media as far as giving quality feedback. If I need to interact with people on social media and talk to people, my evening hours are best for that for me personally. However, if you are a language person, so if you're a writer, a person that creates, this is a space where it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an owl or a lark to find a good time. You can create the language really any time of the day. And there's studies out here. I did not come up with this. So personally, I do my best writing in my mid-morning hours. And that's because I am not, I'm very introspective in my mid-morning hours. I am not wanting to talk to people, see people like I want to come to terms with the world on my own. I want to drink my coffee. I want to think, I want to pray. I want to do my daily devotional. And then I want to write. So, and I try to do this before I consume any social media, before I consume any podcasts, before I consume anything outside of my internal well being. So, know that, all right? Know that if, and then the analytics, like the analytics are going to be later in the day for me. So, I like, I am not prepared to deal with, with research and numbers and studying the algorithm. <laughs> or my insights or anything like that early in the morning. I want to talk about that later in the day. So find out what that looks like for you. And you can do that by charting, like keeping notes in a notebook. Okay. I was really, I had a great conversation with this person at this time of the day and it resulted in this amount of sales, or I wrote this many words at this time of the day. So take note of that, you guys, and tailor your schedule around that. So I'm not going to schedule a conference call with someone at eight o'clock in the morning because I don't want to talk to anybody at eight o'clock in the morning. I just accept God. That's the only person I want to see at 8 a.m. So take note of that and put that into your schedule. Work that with your schedule, okay? Own your hours, your most productive hours. Now, number four, she talks about planning your plan, your schedule weekly. I do that. We talked about this. I plan my schedule weekly, monthly, annually, but I want to also hammer down the point of how important it is to bring the people in your space into your schedule with you. So we have conversations within the family 
and we have iCals that are shared within the family. Now, there are apps you can get. I don't use an app for my family planning. I do for business. Schedulicity works great if you're a person that schedules conference calls or interviews for podcasts or anything like that. Schedulicity really helps you um, get a handle on scheduling those hours out. But for the family, we have an iCal that is shared between my husband and I. And then I have separate email addresses for different calendars within the iCal. So I have one that is for like all things relative to my husband and myself, like things that he and I both need to know about. That includes uh, a, a vacation rental, a cabin rental that we have so that if I drop the ball and forget that I have guests in the cabin that weekend, he knows it's on there. And then that's going to be all things like when we have meetings, business meetings that we need to do together, when we have family birthday parties, when we have social events that we need to be at, that is all in one place. And then we have a separate calendar that is the kids calendar. So on this calendar, we have dentist appointments, baseball practices, basketball practices, um, parties at school, all kids activities. That is also shared with not just my husband and I, but also my dad and stepmom, because when we're out of town, they help us with the kids a lot. And so that way they know the baseball schedule and, and all of the kids schedules without me having to shoot that over to them in case I forget to tell them. It's amazing. It's a lifesaver. And then we, then I have a separate account that is just for my beauty business for all of those events and things that I can keep track with. And then there's another one that is for the power project and it has my interviews and my conferences and my meetups. So that is a way to help take the burden off of you and share with your family and discuss with your family. So going back to my Sundays, we talk about that as a family, like, okay, guys, we have this week, track meet Monday, baseball Tuesday, baseball practice Wednesday, baseball practice Thursday, baseball game Friday, baseball game Saturday. We also have a dentist appointment on Wednesday and mom's going to be gone on Monday and Thursday. So dad, you're in charge of dinner and kids, you should probably help remind dad of that. So we work as a family unit. Now, if you have younger kids, I get it. They're not going to really be helpful, but I'm going to tell you it's never too early to bring your kids in on your schedule. I started this when my kids were five and eight, and it looked like a poster board that had our schedule itemized out for the month. And it was taped on my office wall so that they could see and we could see where we were going and what we were doing. And it helps to just relieve that like crazy crazy craziness of like, what the heck am I doing? How am I doing it? So those are my personal takeaways with how to overcome the I don't have time objection because we're all going to like put our time on things that we prioritize. And then um, setting goals and being the woman that you can like whoever you want to be, be her. Don't worry about what the other women are doing. I hope you guys are enjoying this and I will be back on the Power Project over on Facebook next Thursday and I'm not certain what time yet. I'm shooting for 11 o'clock. So we'll see, but I'm also flexible. That's the other thing with the schedule. You have to be flexible and you have to know that I can have the greatest plans laid out, but there is a whole world out there beyond my control and I have to roll with it and bounce with it if things change. So I hope you guys had a great time. I can't wait to talk to you next week. If you guys want to be a part of next week's book study live and provide your own feedback, or if you just want to be a part of the community where we're discussing the book as a whole, head over to Facebook and check out Power Project Community Group. That's where we'll be talking about this book I will be posting videos on the Power Project page itself and then sharing to that group. But within that group, you have the opportunity of being a panelist in next week's study. Have you written a review of this podcast yet? You guys, I am begging you to head over to iTunes and write a review. This is how I am able to bring you more content each week that you can go forth and apply in your life. 
Speaking of your life, have you told your friends? Because they could use this too. As always, I can't wait to chat with you next week, but until then, go live your best purpose-filled life.